So thanks for inviting me. Uh, I guess, you know, blockchain is one place where AI uh, finance uh, security intersects. And today's talk is going to be about blockchain. Uh, I guess for the Zoom attendees, I cannot see you. So if you have any questions, like, we're we're gonna gonna have, the yes, we're going to read out the questions. So you can have any questions. Okay. okay, sounds good. Yeah, you can uh, type it in the chat. Uh, okay, this is John work with my student, Hao, Hao Chang. Okay, so what's the transaction fee mechanism? So this is a decentralized mechanism design problem. And that kind of, it, it departs from classical mechanism design. Uh, in blockchains, as we know, the block space is, is a scarce resource, and there can be many users who want their transactions confirmed in this limited amount of space, and that's why we need to run an auction to decide whose transactions to collect. Um, okay, so if you look at uh, today's transaction fee mechanism, so let's take Bitcoin, for example. Bitcoin runs a very simple first price auction. Uh, meaning everyone uh, will just, uh, you know, everyone bids and then we take the K highest bid, uh, where K is the block space, uh, and then everyone just pays their own bid. And all the payment goes to the miner. So this is the, the transaction fee collected by the miner. Uh, and as we know, um, you know, from classical mechanism design, first price option isn't an awesome option. In particular, if you just use the first price option, then people are incentivized to bid strategically. Like maybe my best strategy is to bid just like barely enough so I can get included, but I, I pay the minimum possible. That's not too great. Um, so you may ask, okay, you know, we've had many years of study on mechanism design. Why don't we use like, let's say second price option, which was classically believed to be an awesome option. So if we were to run second price option in the setting, and again, in this example, let's say the block size is four, we want to confirm four transactions. Uh, and so second price option says they need to pay the fifth price, uh, which is three in this case. And what's the problem here? The problem is like in a decentralized environment, even the auctioneer can be a strategic player. So in this case, the auctioneer is the miner who mines the block. So the miner, is incentivized to inject some transaction, which is just epsilon less than the case price. And in this way, everyone will be paying five instead of three and the miner will be earning more. Okay. Um, so there's been a line of work that looked at this new decentralized mechanism design question. And um, all of them, they basically converge a set to a set of like desirable properties. So what is a dream transaction fee mechanism? We want the following properties to be satisfied. First, just like in classical mechanisms, we want the user incentive compatibility, which says a user's best strategy is just to bid triple it. Uh, but besides this classical requirements, we also have new requirements arising in this decentralized environment. We, we also want minor incentive compatibility, right? So we want to make sure the minor's best interest it's also to just implement on this mechanism, and it doesn't make sense for the miner to deviate. Uh, and not only so, in a decentralized environment, the miner can collude with some of the users. Like in, in particular, they can enter some smart contracts, which form, allows them to form a coalition, and they can use the smart contract to split up their things off the table. Um, and that's why we also want a new notion called play contract toolkit. Um, and this notion is parameterized by a parameter C, and C is the maximum number of users the miner can collude with. Okay. And then. So if you say users, it's like people with accounts. Uh, it's the bidders. The, the, uh, mm -hmm. So C and C2 basically says if the miner forms a coalition with a subset of the bidders, as, let's say up to C bidders, then um, their best interest is also to display on the table. Meaning the users will bid honestly and the miner will implement the mechanism honestly. And by deviating, they don't get any. As a, is there going to be a restriction of C? Um, so, like for instance, for our lower bound, we only need C equal to one, which gives the strongest lower bound possible. And for our upper bound, we have arbitrary C. Okay. 
so again, these two uh, MIC and CICP are new requirements arriving in the decentralized environment. Okay. Uh, so in an earlier work by Tim Rothgarden, he raised a very important question. Uh, basically, can we have a dream transaction fee mechanism? And if you look at this line of work, it's quite interesting because all of the previous mechanisms that have been proposed and discussed in the literature, they all fall short of satisfying all three properties. So none of them are dream. And you might ask, okay, is this um, just by accident or is there some fundamental mathematical barrier? Okay. So what's also interesting is like the closest we have come to in terms of satisfying our three properties is actually Ethereum's 1559. And this mechanism was deployed um, in, I think, August last year. Uh, so for the purpose of this talk, it's not so important to understand the details of 1559. So just for your curiosity, I'm going to describe it in, um, somewhat imprecisely. So 1559 has, has two modes of operation. Uh, when you are congested, you just operate like Bitcoin's first price option. And, and we know, you know, that this is not ideal. This is like incentivizes untrue forbidding. And when things are uncongested, meaning um, there are few bits and the block space is enough to contain all the bits, then the mechanism behaves like a post to price option. And so imagine there's a fixed reserve price, and any bit that's within at least the reserve price will get picked up, confirmed, and they just pay the reserve price. So the reserve price is also called the post bit price. Uh, and what's interesting is that all the payment doesn't go to the miner. All of the payment actually gets burned. So the miner actually doesn't get any transaction fee. Uh, in practice, this doesn't mean the miner gets nothing. The miner is still getting a fixed block reward. So this, this fixed block reward is a constant as far as the game theoretic analysis is involved. So we just ignore it in the model. Okay. Um, and, and Tim Rothgarden basically he showed in this uncongested regime, actually 1559 can satisfy all three properties. So this is why I said this is the closest we have come to in terms of satisfying all three properties. But I mean, of course, in practice, thing, things do get congested, right? Because there can be a demand peak, like people are buying NFTs. And in those scenarios, like this mechanism is not too great. Let me ask you, how do they decide when it's congested and when it's not? Like, oh, yeah. So that's a very good question. Actually, Ethereum, and they have like a, a exploration mechanism, like they adjust the base fee, adjust the reserve price based on the recent history. And their goal is to find a reserve price such that there's no congestion. But um, like sometimes if there's a spike in demand, uh, the reserve price doesn't adjust fast enough. And in, in those cases, we will be in the congested region. Okay. So as I said, we want to understand whether um, it's an accident, why existing mechanisms don't satis satisfy all three properties or whether there's a fundamental mathematical barrier. And we show that, you know, if the block size is finite, meaning congestion can happen, that it's actually mathematically impossible to satisfy all three properties, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but you know, perhaps this isn't the end of the world. Uh, and then we also consider how to basically overcome this uh, impossibility result. And in particular, we observed that uh, there are like in the existing models, uh, some parts of it are too draconian. And we show that by relaxing the model, we can actually get, get around the flow of and then we are also interested in explaining some of the new elements that arise in decentralized mechanisms. Design. Like for instance, um, in the previous slide, uh, in 1559, as you can see, like what's interesting is that it uses this burning rule. Like the payment doesn't actually go to the miner. Uh, so this is like one new element that you can take advantage of in the blockchain environment. And we are asking, okay, you know, does this burn rule give us like more expressive power? Okay, and then there are other elements. So you, you, you'll see um, uh, throughout the talk that I'm going to point out a new element. Okay, so the plan is the following. Uh, let me first explain the model for transaction fee mechanism design. Um, and I, I want to go over the model just because the model is a little bit different from classical mechanism, uh, classical option. 
And then once we understand the model, I will show how to prove the impossibility results. And then I'll talk about how we can relax the model and get around the thing. Okay. So what is the transaction fee mechanism? You know, we have a bunch of users and they each um, have a true value. Uh, so let's say Tim has a true value of 12, meaning if his transaction is confirmed, he gets a utility, uh, he gets like value of 12. Okay. And then uh, they will each post a bid. I mean, if like the mechanism incentivizes truthful bidding, they should just opt their true value. Uh, and um, the miner will construct a block and the block will pick up a subset of these bits. Okay, so first we need to, uh, to define a transaction fee mechanism, we need to specify the inclusion rule. The inclusion rule basically says among the uh, this mempool, the set of bits that are outstanding, which one should I pick up and include in the block? And this inclusion rule is implemented by the miner and the miner can distribute it. Okay, second, we need the confirmation rule and the payment rule. Uh, so this, these rules are actually implemented by the blockchain. So we can assume that they are implemented in a trustworthy manner. Uh, so in other words, once the inclusion rule has been decided, uh, then the blockchain will look at other included bits and decide among these included bits, which of them are confirmed and how much they should pay. So it is not necessarily the case that all bits included must be confirmed. So some, some can just be there to set the price for other bits, but the transaction hasn't taken effect yet. Like, like let's say if I'm selling you a car and my bid is included in the block, but it's not confirmed, then I should wait. I should not ship you the car yet. Okay. Um, so why do we need this ability to include unconfirmed transactions? Like let's take second price auction, for example. Second price auction is not an awesome auction in a decentralized environment, but it can illustrate uh, the reason here. Uh, even if you just want to implement as something as simple as second price auction, the point is that the blockchain cannot read any state outside of the blockchain itself. So you want to use like, so these are confirmed and they're paying um, the K plus first price, right? So the K plus first price actually has to be included in the block itself, even though it is not confirmed. Okay. Um, so that's confirmation and, and payment rule. And then, Okay, uh, uh, as I said, this is implemented by blockchain, so we can trust, trust it to be implemented in an honest manner. Okay, and finally, we have the minor revenue rule, and this basically tells you how much minor revenue you will earn. And, and what's interesting here is we allow partial to full burning. So let's say everyone, in, in, let's say in the second price example, right, everyone's paying five. And the miner doesn't necessarily collect all the payments. You can burn part of the payments or even all of the payments. Um, and in general, we want to make sure the minor revenue is upper bounded by the total use of payments. Okay. And the minor revenue rule is also implemented by blockchain and it's always implemented in the category manner. Okay, so that's the model. Uh, and the utility function is uh, in the most natural manner, right? So basically a user's utility is um, its true value minus its payment if it's confirmed. Otherwise, if it's not confirmed, the utility is always zero. You don't have to pay anything. Your utility is zero. And the miner's utility is basically its revenue. Okay, so with this model in mind, we can actually embark on the impossibility proof. Can I ask you, how do you model it? How do you enforce the inclusion? Because that's upside the yeah, so that, that's the goal of mechanism design. So our goal is to design a mechanism where the miner is always incentivized to implement. Right, you can not force anything, but it is- To incentivize them to play on this game. Okay. Uh, so let's prove the impossibility together. Uh, again, what do we want to prove? Uh, we want to prove the following statement. Assume the block size is finite. Then um, no non-trivial transaction fee mechanism can satisfy both UIC and one SDC. So there are a couple of things to observe in this statement. Like when it, I only need two out of the three properties to rule it out. I only need U, UIC and one SDC. I don't even need MIC. And this makes the lower bound even stronger. Uh, and also for SDC, I only need uh, the minor to prove with just a single user. And that also makes the lower bound stronger. Okay. 
So how can we prove something like this? And the high level idea is we want to characterize the setup mechanisms that satisfy UIT and characterize the, the, the solution space that satisfies uh, one at least. And I want to show, okay, this impose conflicting set of requirements and therefore we rule it out. Okay, and then, um, so first, you know, what's the solution space for UIT? And this is actually already answered by the classical option theory, right? So there's this famous Meyer dilemma uh, that tells that uh, if a transaction fee mechanism satisfies UIT, then the following must be true. So number one, the inclusion rule and the confirmation rule must be monotone, meaning let's say if I'm confirmed now, and let's say everyone else, uh, their, their bits stay the same, so the rest of the world stays the same, Let's say I am confirmed now, I increase my bid, I should still be confirmed after increasing my bid. And the converse is also true. Let's say the rest of the world remains unchanged. I'm not confirmed now, and I lower my bid, and then I should still be unconfirmed. Okay, so that's monotone, and it's a very natural requirement. Uh, and uh, the marathon lemma also says, if the mechanism is UIT, then the payment rule is uniquely specified once you specify the inclusion and confirmation rule. And so what is the unique payment rule? Um, if I'm confirmed, I should be paying the minimal amount, the minimum amount I could have bid and which still allows me to be confirmed. So in other words, let's say I'm confirmed now. How much should I pay? We can consider the following experiment. I'm going to lower my bid little by little. And at some point, there's going to be a critical transition point where I become unconfirmed. I switch from confirmed to unconfirmed. And that critical, Point is the price I should be paid. Okay, so this is just quick review of Myerson now. And I guess Myerson, he actually won the Nobel Prize for this line of work. Okay, so now we understand okay, this is the set of requirements imposed by UIT. And then in, in the remainder of the proof, we want to look at you know, why these set of requirements conflict with uh, one FD. Uh, and to prove the theorem, uh, we need to prove the following key lemma. So for any mechanism that satisfies UIC and one SCP, I want to show the minor revenue always has to be zero. And actually this key lemma holds no matter whether the block size is in our final. Like in, in our final theorem, we require the block size to be final. But for this key lemma, we don't even um, need this assumption. Or uh, even if I just need like no congestion, let's say the block size is large enough, to accommodate all the all the bits. So infinite finite is another way of saying whether there's congestion or no congestion. Okay. Um so actually this lemma on its own is very interesting because it actually explains that this burn rule, remember I said 1559 satisfies all three properties when the block size is infinite. And notice in 1559, every all the pieces gets burned. The minor gets nothing. And this key lemma shows that the burning is necessary. Without the burning, you cannot hope to satisfy all three properties, even in the infinite block size region. Okay, so let's first prove this key lemma together. And then once we prove the key lemma, we can throw in the finite block size assumption and reach the final impossibility. Okay. How do we prove this? Um, Okay, we can prove by contradiction. Suppose there is a transaction fee mechanism with positive minor revenue uh, that satisfies both UIC and one SCP. And what I want to do is the following. So imagine, so because the, by assumption, this transaction fee mechanism has positive minor revenue, right? So there must exist some bit configuration where the minor revenue is positive, and let's call that bit configuration fee one to the end. And I want to start from here. And one by one, lower each uh, unit bit to zero. And I want to show, okay, in the process, the minor revenue should be un unaffected. Okay. And if that's the case, let's say I lower B1 to zero, minor revenue unaffected, and then I can lower B2 to zero, B3 to zero. And at the end of the day, everyone, everyone's bid is zero. And in this case, the minor revenue must be zero because no one's paying anything. So now we conclude the minor revenue must be zero. Okay, so it suffices to prove that when I lower B1 to zero, minor revenue is unaffected. Okay, so this is just what I said. So let's focus on the same statement uh, I want to prove. 
uh, I lower a single unit fit to zero and show the minor variable is unaffected. Okay, so there are three cases to prove this. The first case is like, let's say initially D1 is not confirmed, and now I lower it to zero, and I want to argue minor revenue is unaffected. Okay, so to show this, I want to show the minor revenue does not increase and it does not decrease. And I will show one direction first, and because the other direction is like almost symmetric. So let's show the minor revenue does not decrease. And why is this the case? So suppose the minor revenue actually decreases by delta in the project. Uh, I can show this violates one SAP because um, let's say the user's uh, true value. Um, so, okay, so this is initially when the user is bidding B1, it's not confirmed, right? And then when it's bidding zero, of course, it's also not confirmed. So in either case, the user's utility is just zero because it's not confirmed. So the user is actually indifferent to bidding either B1 or zero. But now from the miner's perspective, um, the miner actually has a preference. Right? The miner prefers if the user bids um, B1. So let's say, imagine some, some scenario where the user's true value is actually zero. Um, and the rest of the world is all we so in this case, the, the first user, it should not be zero, it should be B1 instead, because that helps the miner. Like the user himself is indifferent, but the miner prefers if the user is B1. So they should actually collude and they can gain more, basically. And this violates uh, one This violates one Because one SCP says, when the miner colludes with the user, they should not be able to do better by deviating. And then in a symmetric manner, I can also show the minus revenue should not increase when I lower B1 to zero. Okay, so the first case is easy. Second case is like, okay, in the first case, we started out when, you know, initially, let's say B1 is not confirmed. So in the second case, imagine B1 is confirmed uh, in the beginning, and now I lower it to zero. So this case will be slightly more involved. Um, and again, I want to show the minor revenue does not increase and does not decrease. And I can pick one direction and then it's one. I want to show the minor revenue does not decrease. Uh, and to show uh, the proof for case two, we will divide it into three steps. So imagine the user when bidding P1 is paying P1. So P1 is that critical transition point. When I bid less than P1, I become unconfirmed, right? Because that's my payment price as specified by the IS gamma. So first I'm going to lower B1 to P1. And now I'm going to lower P1 to just epsilon less than P1. And then I go all the way to zero. And the reason why I'm doing this is okay, so I argue lowering from B1 to P1, um, that the proof is similar to the case we have seen. Um, and we, we can do it together again, but it's essentially the same proof. So, so, so suppose in this process, the minor uh, revenue decreases by delta. Um, and notice that no matter whether the user is bidding P1 or P1, it's always confirmed that it's always paying P1. So the user is indifferent to bidding either P1 or P1. However, um, the minor has a preference because the minor prefers if the user bids P1. Right? So let's say if the user's true value is actually P1, then it should collude with the minor and bid B1 instead because this will help the correlation. Okay, so this is kind of the same proof as before. And then the, this bottom region is the same as before, right? This is the unconfirmed region. So what's most interesting is actually the middle uh, middle region. When I lower from P1 to the epsilon less than P1 because this is a critical transition point. And what's interesting here is the confirmation decision changes. At P1, I'm confirmed, but when I lower it, by any amount, I become unconfirmed. Okay. So here, what's going on? So suppose, for the sake of contradiction, the minor revenue decreases by delta when I do this. Okay. Now, what's interesting is imagine a scenario where the user's true value is actually Q1 minus F1. So in this case, I, I argue if this user colludes with the minor, they are better off if the user bids. Uh, untruthfully, if it bids P1 instead. 
because if the user did P1, I mean, of course, the user is suffering a little bit because it's, it has to pay P1, even though its true value is only P1 minus epsilon, right? So the user's utility is minus epsilon. Um, however, even though the user, user is getting hurt a little, the miner is gaining more. The miner gains delta. And because epsilon, you can always make it arbitrarily small. You can make it smaller than delta. And this means by polluting the coalition campaign, which violates one SEC, um, and therefore we can think for the middle region as well. So combining everything, um, okay. So so far I've shown that the minor revenue does not decrease um, when you lower it from P1 to P1 minus epsilon. You can show that uh, the other direction too, the minor revenue should not decrease. When I lower it from P1 to P1 minus epsilon. And actually, this direction is even easier. Uh, basically, if the user's true value is actually P1, then it should fit P1 minus epsilon instead. Because in either case, the user's utility is zero, right? But the minor, um, the minor gains delta when the user did um, P1 minus epsilon instead. Okay. So just to recap, right? So what I've shown is when you lower any user's bid to zero, minor revenue is unaffected, which means the minor revenue has to be zero because I can just lower everyone's bid to zero. And at the end of the day, everyone's bidding zero, the minor is getting zero. Okay, so this gives uh, the key level we want to prove zero minor revenue. And this key level holds even under infinite block time. Okay, so the next step is so far we have not used the finite block size assumption yet. And to prove a low bound, of course, we have to use that requirement right? because otherwise, we have 15 to 9. Uh, and let's do that. Let's throw in this finite block size assumption and get the final impossibility result. Um, and the idea for the proof is the following. Suppose there's a non-trivial transaction fee mechanism that satisfies both UIC and one ICC. So again, proof by contradiction. Um, so if the Mechanism is non-trivial. There must exist a bid vector such that some bid is confirmed. And let's call that bid CJ. Okay. So now imagine the world actually consists of B1 to Bn, but then uh, many, many more bids uh, that are bidding Bj plus epsilon. So a little bit more than Bj. Um, and in particular, there are many more people bidding this number than the block size available. So which means um, one of these bidders won't get included in the block. There's just not enough block space, right? Uh, so now let, let's call that user J. So J is the unfortunate user that will not get included if you run the honest mechanism on this bit vector. So now the, the problem is the miner can collude with this user U. They can form a coalition, right? Now they're friends. And the miner can help its friends by asking its friend to bid BJ instead. And then the minor will just run the honest bid. The minor will just pretend the world consists of B1 to Bn, where BJ is replaced by uh, the friend's bid. And then it runs the honest mechanism pretending the world has this. And we know that when the world actually only has B1 to Bn, BJ will be confirmed. So now, um, uh, the minor, remember the minor's revenue is always zero, right? So the minor is indifferent to its own revenue, but this helps its friends. So as a coalition, they're gaining. Um, and this gives the lower bound. So as you may uh, see, for in this proof, I'm assuming the mechanism is deterministic. But in our paper, we also uh, have a more general proof that even rule out randomized that. And the proof for the randomized case is a little bit more sophisticated. You can read the proof. Yeah, actually, about the randomization, I was wondering about this mayor's lemma you mentioned. Yeah. Like, is it, could it be true that there is such a sharp threshold? Because I imagine. Yeah. That no, the, the randomized case um, has, has a different, slightly different form. Like, it, it, you can. I, I like this ge ge uh, geometric interpretation that you. The, the allocation rule is actually some curve. And in this case, it, it can be put as a continuous curve. Um, and then um, it, it, the step, the payment is like uh, the area, like, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to draw it, but there's a continuous uh, interpret. The, the randomized case is more like a continuous 
interpretation. Um, and we, we are using the, the version of the Myerson lambda for the random landscape to rule out the random. Yeah. So far, here the only place you're using UIC is the blue frame you said of the P1, P1 minus epsilon, that's that threshold, that's that. Yeah. Uh, but you're using it more extensively for the random landscape than the same. Uh, the Myerson lambda. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't know how to define more extensively, but okay. we, we, of course we have to use it, and, okay. and the proof is mark a, a little bit more sophisticated. But I think the high level idea is the same. It's like we want to show these set of requirements that they, they contribute to that. Okay. Um. So yeah, so if you are curious about the randomized case, just read the paper. Uh, and in the rest of the talk, I want to talk about potential ways we can overcome this impossibility result. Um, and one observation we had is that in all of the existing models, they make the following assumption. So if let's say a strategic player injects a fake bid, or if a user overbids above its true value, and let's say this offending bit is not confirmed in the present option instance. If you are not confirmed, you don't have to pay anything, right? So the existing model assumes the cost to deviate like this is zero, cost free. Um, but in practice, you know, the mechanism, the transaction fee mechanism is run again and again. You run it once every block um, is confirmed. And more and more blocks will get confirmed, right? And the point is that even though this offending transaction is not confirmed right now, it's posted to the network. And you cannot retract it, you cannot take it back. So it could be confirmed sometime in the future. And when it gets confirmed in the future, you do have to pay something for this offending transaction. So this could be the cost we incur. So our idea is like, what if we now try to capture this cost to deviate? Um, can we overcome this lower bound? And what's challenging is like actually capturing, capturing this cost is pretty hard because it depends on how much you'll end up paying when you get confirmed in the future. And how much you pay depends on the environment. It depends what other people are bidding at the time. It depends on the mechanism itself. Okay. So how do we tackle this challenge? Uh, so let's first start with the worst case. So in the worst case, let's say I overbid or I post a fake transaction. Imagine sometime in the future, I get confirmed and I end up paying the full bid. That's the worst case. Um, but in some, time, in some sense, this, make it, this makes it easiest for the mechanism designer to achieve incentive compatibility. It makes it harder for the cheaper to behave, to misbehave. Okay, so in this worst case, the cost of the, an overbid transaction is the bid amount minus the true value because I end up paying the full bid. And the cost of a fake transaction, a fake transaction is the same as an overbid transaction where the true value is zero. Right? So the cost of a fake transaction is the bid itself. Okay, um, so that's the worst case, um, but let's imagine there's some parameter gamma and um, that's in expectation, my cost is parameterized by gamma, which is the parameter between zero and one. So I, in expectation, I, I will pay gamma times the worst case cost. So you can think of gamma as like a knob. Um, if gamma is equal to one, that means I need to pay the worst case. So that's the case where we achieve uh, uh, the least amount of resilience. Uh, and it's like easiest for the mechanism designer and hardest for the achiever. When gamma is equal to zero, we should have impossibility, which is the impossibility as good. Yeah, that means you have to pay no cost for this deviation. So this is, uh, in some sense, you can view it as a knob between the efficiency of the mechanism and um, the resilience of the mechanism. In practice, like, you may be able to estimate the gamma somewhat from historical data, but it's not too important to estimate it accurately because in some sense, it's a resilient knob. Okay, and we also call it the discount factor, gamma. 
Um, so for the purpose of the, this talk, I'm going to focus on the simple case where gamma is equal to one and C is also equal to one, meaning the minor proof is only one data. In the paper, we do have mechanism um, for general choice of gamma and C. Okay. Uh, so for the special case, there is actually a pretty simple mechanism that achieves all three properties. And the mechanism works as follows. It has a cute name, burning second price option, and you'll see why. Okay. So imagine our block size is six, um, and we have a bunch of bits. So you will take the highest bits and confirm, uh, not, not confirm, include them in the block. And not all of the included um, transactions are confirmed. So in this case, the first three are confirmed, and these three are used to set the price. Okay. Uh, so from the user's perspective, it behaves like a second price option. So the three confirmed users, they're paying the fourth price. So all of them are paying eight. And then the minor revenue is set by these three users. It's eight plus six plus five, right? So in this case, everyone's paying eight. The total payment is 24. The minor is getting eight plus six plus five, which is 19. And five is getting burned. And just keep in mind, these unconfirmed users, they pay nothing. Right. These people pay nothing. All of the payment is coming from the payment is by these three guys. Okay. So I claim this very simple mechanism actually satisfies all these properties um, in a model where you know we have some cost for this uh, deviation. Uh, and let me explain why. Right. So UIC is very easy to see because from the user's perspective, it's just a second price option. Um, and I just need to convince you why, let's say, the mechanism satisfies MIT or one SEC. So let, let me take one SEC, for example. So this is not a formal proof, but it can make the intuition. Okay, so imagine, um, let's say, Andrew colludes with the minor, uh, and Andrew's true value is eight, but he bids nine instead, because um, maybe if he bids nine, it helps the minor. The minor is getting one more. Uh, the minor, in this case, would be getting nine plus six plus five. Um, but on the other hand, we are considering the case where gamma is equal to one, meaning sometime in the future, Andrew's transaction will be picked up by some other block. And in this block, Andrew will be paying nine. So it actually costs Andrew one as well to deviate like this. So now you can see the benefit and the cost, they just offset each other. They cancel out. Um, so intuitively, this is why the protocol achieves one at C. And a similar argument can be made for MIT, minor incentive compatibility. So the, the, new, the new properties to uh, include in a future transaction uh, the, the second option. So I don't understand. The, the, the new, the, the, what really makes this work is this inclusion in the future so That's one of the crucial problems. Um, and what makes this work is like now we uh, assume there's some cost to, to, cheat, to overbid or to in just a safe transaction. In the previous model, there's no cost. Yeah. But here, like let's say if Andrew overbids to nine, uh, it's not free for him to do that. It's not cost free. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's the core uh, thing that is enabling it, right? Like yeah. in the future, uh, there's going to be charged, right? Yeah, that's right. So the reason why we can circumvent this world around is because now we assume that this act will incur some cost for him. Okay. Uh, this is not a formal proof again, and because the formal proof you have to do basically exhaustive analysis case by case, and we have that in the data. Okay. And, and the, so another new element for transaction fee mechanism design is this interesting observation like we can include some transactions in the block that are not confirmed, they're just there to set the price. Uh, and there's like a debate in the community, okay, should we do that? Because like you, there's some disadvantages of doing that because we're wasting some precious block space to contain unconfirmed transactions. Um, but we show actually this ability to include unconfirmed transactions actually makes a difference. Like even if we go with this new utility function I've talked about that cost to some kind of cheating, even in this model, if we require that the blocks do not contain any unconfirmed transaction, then we still get an impossibility. 
So the, the, this behavior you see that the blocks contain unconfirmed transactions is actually needed to get uh, upper bound. Okay. Um, so th th this theorem states that, and the proof is in the paper. I'm not going to explain it in detail. Uh, and as I said, what's also in the paper is we generalize the second price, uh, the burning second price option for general choices of gamma and C. Um, and, and another interesting observation is like the mechanism I've shown here, this is deterministic. It doesn't use any random time. Um, but what's interesting is like for any other choice of gamma and C, the mechanism we have is randomized. And this is actually inherent. We show a lower bound that random kinds are actually necessary to um, achieve any feasibility result um, for any type of gamma and C, except for this very special case we have. So in, in that case, then something's going to break with some probability or something's um, not going to work. Yeah, at a very high level, um, you will be choosing a random subset of these guys to confirm, not, not confirming all of them. And the probability of getting chosen depends on the parameter gamma and C. So it, it turns out just for the case, gamma equal to one, C equal to one, the probability of getting chosen is one. So that's why this is deterministic. And also another thing is that when C becomes larger and gamma becomes smaller, um, let, let's say if gamma is zero, right? Then, then the probability you get chosen is zero. So this agrees with the impossibility we have seen earlier. So in other words, another way to think about it is as gamma becomes smaller, you get more resilient, but the mechanism becomes more and more inefficient because you're, you're confirming fewer and fewer transactions and you're wasting more and more blocks. Mm -hmm. And this is also inherent in some sense because when gamma is equal to zero, you should see that it's impossible. So there's like there's a graceful like degradation of the efficiency. Okay. Okay, just to summarize, uh, decentralized mechanism design, I, I find it a very fascinating space. Um, the classical mechanisms don't work in a decentralized environment. Uh, and our work is, I think, just the beginning uh, in understanding decentralized uh, mechanism design. Um, there are lots of open questions in this space. Like for instance, right now we are considering a single instance of the auction. So you may ask, okay, how can we model uh, the long scale strategy? Uh, how can we formally reason about long scale strategy? Uh, are there any other relaxations we can make to overcome this lower bound? Uh, so I want to mention, um, Along these lines, we actually have an upcoming work and um, it's accepted into IPCS, where we look at um, how cryptography can help. Right? Because today's transaction mechanism doesn't imply any crypto, but actually crypto is widely deployed in blockchain. Um, so in this paper, we show that if you use cryptography techniques, you can circumvent some of these low Um and in general, I think uh, you know decentralized mechanism design is an exciting space, also partly because it's like where crypto mechanism design, um, and I'm very excited about this space. Thank you very much. Thank you.